the privilege of Christian service. Now, some of you are involved in Christian ministry, in Christian service, but I would say a lot of you aren't, and you need to be because that's what God calls us to. He calls each one of us into ministry of one sort or another. I'd ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, verses um, 24 through 25. It's going to be up on the screen. There it is for you. Let's read it together. And I'm glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for His body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving His church by proclaiming His entire message to you. Well, Lord, this morning I thank you that the Apostle Paul wrote these amazing words. And Lord, I pray this morning that these words would become part and parcel of our lives. Lord, that we would count it such a privilege to be able to serve you. Just the mere fact that we know you is so amazing and so awesome. And so, Lord, I invite your presence this morning, your Holy Spirit, to take the Word of God, write it on the tablet of our heart. Lord, write it deep down in our very being. And, Father, search our hearts that you would bring us to that place in our lives, Lord, where we can repurpose our lives, that we can um, serve you in the manner that you call us to. And this morning, Lord, we're not sure where you want us. And, Lord, we, we, fi- we pray this morning that you would reveal that to each one of us. We pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Ministry was a real important part of the Apostle Paul's life. It was so, so vitally. I mean, he lived for ministry. He lived that he could serve God in every aspect of his life. And it was a frequent message as you read the epistles of Paul, as you open up the scriptures, and you would read his letter to the Romans, you would read his letter to the, to, to the Philippians and, and to the Ephesians, and even in our case this morning, Colossians, you would find how important ministry was to him. Paul never lost the sense of wonder, though. He never lost the sense of, of, of just the amazing thing that God could call him as, a, as, a, as an individual to serve the Almighty God. And I wonder this morning, do we have that same wonder? Do we have that same amazing of, of like that, that ah moment where, where we come to God and we say, Lord, I just can't believe that you've called me. I just can't believe that you've revealed yourself to me as an individual. The Bible says, and as, as Paul would write to, to the Romans, he says in the 15th chapter, even so I have been bold enough to write about some of these points, knowing that you all need that all you need is this reminder, for by God's grace, I am a special messenger from Jesus, from Christ Jesus to you Gentiles. And I bring you the good news so that I might present you as an acceptable offering to God made for by the Holy Spirit. This was his ministry. He called us. And Paul was called as a special minister to come and present the entirety of God's holy word to men and women and young people just like us that are seated here this morning. He eagerly affirmed that he had been given the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile people back to God. He confirmed that every time he would write his his epistles. And you know what? By default, or not by default, he actually taught this, that you and I have also been given the ministry of reconciliation. That you and I really don't have a choice. That you and I have such a privilege of serving God in the ministry of reconciliation. It's not optional for you and I as believers. We have this ministry that God calls us to. I wonder when the last time was that you used this ministry that God had entrusted to you. That's the question this morning. When last have you asked Jesus, Lord, use me in the ministry of reconciliation and bringing people into the knowledge of Jesus Christ? We, would, we too should never lose the sense of, of this marvelous calling that God has entrusted to us as believers. He's entrusted. Imagine the God of the universe, the one who created it all, came to you, rescued you, saved you, and he said, Sharon, Steve, Bob, I'm giving you this ministry. Here's the privilege. And, and, and as we receive that from Jesus, we receive that. As, imagine God entrusting that to, to a human being. He entrusted that. Jesus Christ has entrusted this ministry of reconciliation to you and I this morning as believers. 
But what are we doing with this ministry that He's given to us? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, we find that scripture. For all this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself, He brought us to Himself, and then through Christ has gives us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Through Jesus, we have been given this ministry. And it's a marvelous ministry that we can serve God. All Christians have been called to serve God in one capacity or another. It's not optional for you as a believer. And if you're not serving God this morning and you call yourself a Christian, you're probably really not a Christian. Because we cannot help but serve God as men and women and young people. If we are not serving God, then we then we, really not, then we really don't know Him because God has entrusted this awesome responsibility to us. And just as God calls us to salvation, He also calls us to service. He calls us to serve Him. Now, I'm not talking that we are, are, are preaching a message of works because we're saved by grace, not through works. We are saved by grace by as we place our faith in Him. But the result of that is service to God. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. And these are enablements for the service of one another according to the will of God. So the Spirit of God whom Jesus sent after He ascended into heaven and you came at Pentecost equipped us for service that you and I can be equipped. It is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person, person should have. Some of us have this gift, and others have that gift. But they're all given to the body of Christ that you and I can serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Not only serve Him, but also minister to one another. Because the gifts are given that we could build one another up and strengthen one another. And each one of you has been given a gift or two or three, or how many the Holy Spirit decides to give to you. Spiritual gifts are given to us, that are given to us are not intended specifically for our own edification, but to help us to minister to others, to help us in the ministry, to serve one another. That's why the gifts have been given to us, not for our own glorification or our own, but there to serve, serve the Lord first and foremost, and then one another. Paul never sought any glory for himself. It was all about giving glory to God. He had a God-given task, and he was obligated to fulfill that task. God called him to the ministry of reconciliation, and he felt obligated. He couldn't control himself. He, this is all he wanted to do, is serve God. He declared boldly in the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians, Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about, he says, for I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. How awful it would be for him if, we, if he didn't share, if he didn't preach the good news. How terrible for us if we don't share the good news. How terrible for us. And if, if I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice for God has given me the sacred trust. God has given to each one of us the sacred trust of reconciliation. Note the word sacred. It is holy. It is a holy trust that God Himself has given to you, has given to me, has given to us as a church, as a body of Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. And towards the end of his life, he told his protege Timothy, and he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, and He has considered me trustworthy, appointing me to His service. He, he, was so, uh, he was so in awe of what God had entrusted to him. Shouldn't we be the same? Shouldn't we by the same way be, be so amazed and so in awe that God himself, think about this, the creator, the redeemer, the savior of the world has entrusted you and me and us together with a sacred holy call of service, of ministry. It's pretty amazing if, if, if it just could just penetrate our cranium and just get in there. And he says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor, a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But now since we have come to know Jesus... We have been, He's revealed Himself to us. We were once like that. 
Maybe some of us were blasphemers. Maybe some of us mocked Christians. Maybe some of us were even violent. In Paul's case, he persecuted the Christians to the utmost. He was there when Stephen was stoned. Standing in the crowd, cheering on probably. Paul felt compelled to carry out his ministry that was given to him specifically by Jesus himself. He said in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, And when I preach the gospel, I, I cannot boast. He says, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. He, he had to tell people because from, he was such a changed man from, from being this persecutor, this violent man. Suddenly Jesus changed his life and he felt compelled. He had to do this. He had to preach the gospel. Paul often spoke of his ministry when he needed to establish the authority and, and his credibility as he did right in the beginning of the book of Colossians. It was his aim in writing the specific passage as well. He had to establish who he was. It was essential for him to defend his authority as he was the one who was speaking for God. He was the one who had the message of God so burning in his heart that he shared to share that with people. Remember that he was confronting the false teachers in the church at Colossae. So as he confronted the heresy, as he confronted Gnosticism, as he confronted the false teachings within the body of Christ in the church, he came with the authority that God had called him to. Paul had begun this letter by stating that he was an apostle. He had an apostolic authority to speak this way. In the verses, he gives a detailed account of his ministry. And, the minister, and, and this ministry thing wasn't just a simple career choice for him. When he woke up one morning and he said, I think I'll become a, a Christian and, and become a preacher of the gospel. No, his career choice was to move up in the echelons of Judaism. Remember, he was taught under the tutelage of Gamaliel, one of the chief rabbis of the time. And he was Saul of Tarsus. He, he, had, planned, he had, had planned his plan, his whole life planned out. And because of his credentials and because they were so impressive, he was called even the Hebrew of Hebrews. He knew the languages of the time. And he was, on top of it, was a Roman citizen. So he could go anywhere within the Roman Empire and share... And, and, and persecute and pursue believers. And it was one, he was like this one, one man crusade to wipe out the church, this new cult within Judaism. He, it was, he took it upon himself to, to get rid of this, this new movement within Judaism, the ones who were following the Messiah, who were following this, this man, Jesus. That was his mission in life. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 26, because as he was standing before King Agrippa, he gave a defense of his faith and, and he spoke about how important it was and, and, and what Jesus had done to him and how Jesus had commissioned him in Acts chapter 26. There it is over there. Verses 12 through 18. So he tells King Agrippa in, in, in this, he says, One day I was in such a mission. What? The mission, as he, the mission was to go and persecute the, the Christians, to go get rid of these guys. He was on this mission, on his way, on a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priests. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down, and I heard the voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, Lord? I replied. I asked. And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up off your feet, for I have appeared to you and appoint you as my servant and witness. You are to tell the world what you have seen and what I will show you in the future. I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. They will receive the forgiveness of their sins and will be given a place amongst God's people who are set apart by faith in me. This was Paul's commission by Jesus himself. God revealed it and, and sh shone his light into his life. And that moment on his road to Damascus, we call that the, the, his Damascus road experience. We and I, you and I have those experiences. When Jesus appears in our life, when Jesus does a radical transformation, and at that time Jesus said, you are to be the one to take the message to the Gentile world, to all the people of the world apart from my people, and yes, my people also. 
What a message. And I thank God for this revelation that the Apostle Paul had. Because he knew the Word of God so, so intimately, it became so real to him as Jesus opened up his eyes to the truth of the Gospel. Paul was appointed by Jesus himself to become a minister of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ calls you and I to become ministers, to become those who are called by His name, to minister in the ministry of reconciliation. The body of Christ, that is every church, of every household, every believer has a responsibility to manage the ministries that God has given to him. Everything that God has given to us, whatever ministry that might be of the Holy Spirit. Some of us who are followers of Jesus need to repurpose our lives toward that goal. Some of us that are here this morning, you, you have no purpose. And Jesus is saying to you, you need to repurpose your life. You need to get on track with me. You need to find a new meaning for your life. Repurpose your life. Remember that it was Jesus who established the church. And in verse 23, Paul states that he was a minister serving the truth and the hope of the gospel. He was serving the truth. And I love that he serves and the hope of the gospel. Without that, we have nothing. In verse 25, he says, I've become its servant by the commission that God gave to me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness. Do you and I present God's Word in its fullness, in all its glory to people that we encounter? Remember that when, that when we began our study several weeks, many weeks ago, I told you that Paul during this time had been imprisoned and he was imprisoned in Rome. But I love how Paul turns his imprisonment, he turns it around and he uses his imprisonment, he uses his bad circumstance, he uses his incarceration, to do something amazing. He takes that and he just turns it around. And instead of being ashamed of his suffering, he rejoiced in it. He rejoiced in suffering. Well, you think, how on earth? How on earth can anyone rejoice in suffering? Well, Paul rejoiced and he suffered because of Jesus Christ. He, he counted uh, uh, as, as, as being joyous because he could suffer for Jesus. Like the early apostles Paul rejoiced that he was even counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus Christ. He counted it a privilege and he rejoiced in the fact that he could suffer. I often think of those who are being persecuted in the world today. Those believers in Syria, and those, those believers in those cities like Aleppo and, 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 and in, even in Iraq, Fallujah and those other countries where the church was once Powerful, it was strong. And how, the, how, how they're being persecuted for their faith. And yet in the midst of that, I, I, I've, I've seen videos and heard stories. They rejoice that they can give their lives to Jesus. The apostles in Acts chapter 5, when they were incarcerated and after they were let go, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had accounted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. They rejoiced in the fact I wonder about you and I. If we were ever to face a situation like that, could we rejoice? I'm being persecuted. I'm suffering for Jesus. And we would rejoice in that. I believe we should never suffer as an evildoer, as the Bible says, but it is an honor to suffer as a believer. The Apostle Peter said these words, If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, Stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. Don't suffer for that. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by His name. Praise God. And it is a privilege. He called it a privilege to suffer for the name of Jesus. There is a special blessing and reward reserved for the faithful believer who suffers for the sake of Christ. Jesus himself said that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. He says we're blessed when that happens. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So they were suffering. Jesus himself said, we will suffer in this world. Jesus never promised us a rose garden, as the song goes. 
He did promise us, you will have difficulty in this world. You will suffer in this world. And Steve, you're making me feel like a downer, like I don't even want to serve the Lord anymore. No, no, I'm not finished yet. Because Jesus comes and Paul takes these words and he, as he says it is a blessing to suffer for Jesus. Paul also had another cause in, in his writing here for suffering and rejoicing in his suffering. He rejoiced and suffered because of the Gentiles. Remember, he was Jewish, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And I said, I rejoice that I can suffer for the Gentiles. And in fact, he was, why was he imprisoned in Rome? He was imprisoned in Rome because of his love for the Gentiles. The Jewish rabbis and the Pharisees and, and such, the leaders of the Sanhedrin couldn't stand the fact that Paul was reaching out to the non-believers, to the non-Jewish community. And so they took it upon themselves to have him incarcerated, to have him put away because he was causing problems. He was causing this, this movement of, of, of the way to grow. We had, they had to get rid of him. Well, they thought they got rid of Jesus, the founder of our faith. Now they had to get rid of his messenger, the Apostle Paul. So they, they, they sent him off and he was incarcerated because of his ministry to the Gentiles. And then thirdly, he rejoiced and suffered for the sake of Christ's body, the church. That is everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, everyone who is born again of the Spirit of God is part of the body of the church of Jesus Christ. Not just the ones that are seated in buildings on a Sunday morning. Before, pers before Paul persecuted the church, and now he devoted his life to take care of the church of Jesus. He devoted, he was so committed to, to bless the church and be a minister within the body of Christ. Paul never asked what he could get out of it, but rather what, he, what, he, what, what God would let him do for it. Lord, how can I serve the church? How can I serve your body? How can I, how can I be more effective in my ministry? And even though Paul was a prisoner in Rome, he did, it didn't prevent him, even in that time, to be a minister of the ministry of reconciliation, of bringing people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Colossians verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what was still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, stop for a moment. I want you to take special note here. Uh, um, in my notes, I have NB, note well. Really important. This is, I want you to get this message, okay? Paul's sufferings had nothing to do with the sacrificial suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. He couldn't pay more than what Jesus had already paid for. The scripture, this, this scripture has actually been taken so out of context and doctrines have been built upon it. The scripture has been taken so out of context and imagined as a reference for the suffering of Christians after they die in purgatory. Because this teaching is that Christ's suffering on the cross of Calvary wasn't enough. As if it, it wasn't complete. And that's where that teaching comes from. It is the teachings that it wasn't enough to completely rid us of our sin. Christians must take up what was lacking in Christ's suffering on the cross and still pay for what was lacking in purgatory. And when they've paid enough, then they can move on after death. Last week I told you that Paul demonstrated that Christ alone is sufficient, that He alone is the one who can reconcile us back to God. There is no other way. He paid the price completely. He took the sin of humanity, not just one or two sins. He took the entirety sin of humanity upon His shoulders. He died for you and I. And when we receive Him as Lord and Savior in His life, He takes our sin, all of it wrapped up upon Himself. He paid a complete price. There was nothing lacking in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The New Testament is clear that Christ's suffering didn't need anything added to them. It was sufficient. In Christ's death on the cross, the work of salvation was complete. Period. It was done. There was nothing more needed. And are, there are churches that teach a heresy regarding this, that there is still something more that is needed. It's, er it's erroneous. It's heretical that there is still to be more suffering after we've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that needs to be accomplished in purgatory. Matter of fact, there's no mention of purgatory ever in the Bible. 
It doesn't exist. Steve, what are you talking about? I came from that teaching. And it's only as we open up the Scriptures and the Word of God that we stand on the Word of God. And as Paul said, he proclaims the Gospel in its entirety. The truth of the Gospel. And folks, that's what you and I need to stand for as well. He's called us to be ministers of reconciliation. The physical afflictions that Paul experienced at the hands of, of Christ who are hating persecutors because of what he had done to benefit and build the church. That was at the hands of others. He was being persecuted, he was suffered, and he was suffering in different ways. But not to complete or to add to Christ's sufferings. It was sufficient. People still hate Christ today, so much so because now Jesus has ascended into heaven. We are now His followers. We have the Holy Spirit who lives within us. And so it is illogical, it, is to it makes total sense that those who still hate Jesus to this day, and there are many of those, who would they then persecute? And who would they hate? Well, the ones who represent Jesus. That's you and I today, as Paul did in his day. And so they would launch their, their hatred and, and their, their violence against those who call themselves believers. We see that cl clearly in the believers who are being persecuted today. In 2 Corinthians chapter, five, verse one, um, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. We know that if we suffer for Jesus, we know that His Spirit, we have comfort in the presence of Jesus. And those who wish to represent Jesus in His church must be willing to suffer for His name. I don't know what the suffering is for His name that you and I would experience. Maybe you've experienced it. Maybe you've come from parts of the world where you have been persecuted. Or maybe you've encountered it as you've told people about your faith. But I don't believe any of us here this morning have been persecuted to the point of facing death and staring death in the face. But would we even go willingly, and can we suffer like that? I know there's missionaries, and you've read the stories, I've read the stories, that did face death and lost their lives and rejoiced in the fact that they could die and face Jesus. Paul fulfilled his call to ministry, and near the end of his life he triumphantly explained to Timothy in, in the second um, book, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Oh, may that be the echo that you and I would, would follow today. That at the end of our day, we could say with Paul, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. May that be true for you and I today. That we fought the fight, we have kept the faith, and we finished the race. When Jesus left earth, he expected all his believers to follow in his steps. He gave, the, he gave, uh, he gave his life to them, that they too may, may, may have eternal life with him. But he, he didn't stop there. He said that when you follow me, you're going to suffer. Jesus reminded us in John 15, Remember what I told you, he said, A servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And if they obeyed my teaching, they would obey yours. But just as they persecuted Jesus and nailed Him to the cross, and ultimately He gave His life for us, don't be surprised when you are persecuted. Jesus gave us a heads up here, church. Don't find it strange when, when you're facing difficulty, when you're suffering for the name of Jesus. Jesus expects every minister and every believer to suffer for the body of Christ. Why? To complete the church, to bring the, com to, to, to bring the church to fruition exactly what Christ wants it to be. So don't be surprised. Paul explained this to Timothy in his charge to him. And he said, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. He's saying this to his protege. Timothy, you know me. You know me. You know everything about me. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from it all. Now there are times when God does rescue us, but there are other times when we have to persevere in the midst of suffering. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus will suffer persecution. Paul said this. You want to live a godly life in Jesus? Get ready for suffering. 
And Jesus expects us to pay whatever the price is necessary to build up His church, to build up the body of Christ. Working for Jesus on this earth and for His church is not always easy. He never said that it would be easy. In fact, it would be difficult. And many people today view the church as, 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 as this group of people and it really means nothing. The church is acceptable just as long as it stays within the confines of the walls and doesn't go outside here. We've experienced that right here in East Rockaway. As long as you guys just meet on a Sunday morning, it's fine. But there was a time when we had another church that met on a Saturday and the flack and the hassles that we got here were unbelievable from the neighborhood. Well, you, we, we thought it only met on a Sunday. Well, guess what? We meet every day of the week. And if we decided to do that and have prayer meetings and have all these things going on every day of the week, tough. We didn't tell them to move next to the church. The church was here and it's been here for over a hundred years. They haven't. They expect the church to just to be a social service to the community. Oh, when there's a need, just knock on the door. The church is going to help you. They'll pay your rent. They'll pay your bills. They'll pay whatever you need. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus calls the church to. Some see the church as being good because it meets the religious needs of mankind. You know, it's good for those who say they're Christians. You know, it makes them happy as long as they're happy. While others ridicule and persecute and abuse and attempt even to destroy the body of Christ. Sadly, however, there are many so-called Christians who profess Christ and even join the church, but their commitment is almost meaningless. They say, oh, we want to be part of the church, we want to serve, and yet none of them serve. They are inactive, unconcerned, non-supportive, complacent, sleepy-eyed, and lack the vision for the body of Christ. The church is full of lukewarm Christians. And to make things worse, there are even those amongst within, within the church who gossip, who are divisive, critical, who murmur, who whisper, who are carnal and worldly in the body of Christ. And yet God calls us to have a ministry of reconciliation, and yet we behave like this. I can talk about this, and I'm going to share a little bit. When Sharon and I first came here, the church was like minute. It was an old age home. It was. The doors were about to close, and I was told that by the district superintendent. Some of you could remember that. Some of you have been here. And there were people in this church that would go outside and meet people in the parking lot and tell them not to come into the church because they hated me so much. And these are Christians? I, got, I experienced that firsthand. That's not the church. Those people I don't even believe were Christians because a Christian could never behave like that. How could we hate as believers? We may disagree, but we certainly shouldn't hate. We should be there, as Paul calls us, to reconcile one another, to bring one another together as the body of Christ. You see, not everyone who says they are a Christian are really a Christian. Didn't Jesus say you will know a tree by its fruit? And when I look at people's lives and you look at people's lives, what is the fruit that we see? Is it, is it the fruit of the Spirit or is it the fruit of the flesh? Genuine servants of Christ, of Christ long for people to know Jesus and the abundance of life that He brings. That's my greatest purpose and my desire is that people would so fall in love with Jesus and experience His glory and His majesty that they fall head, head over heels in love with Jesus. That's, that's what the ministry of reconciliation is. A true follower of Jesus wants people to grow into the image of Jesus, keeping the eyes fixed upon Him, the hope of glory which is given to every true believer. The genuine believer knows that people are lost and doomed to judgment. And the genuine follower of Jesus suffers whatever burden and pain is necessary to reach, to disciple, and to grow people in their faith. Whatever it costs. And sometimes the cost pierces the heart. My hope that none of us find ourselves in that situation where we find ourselves gossiping 
where we find ourselves slandering, where we find ourselves degrading rather than building up, rather than encouraging. You see, as a church, that's not what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to come together. You see, there's a price associated with following Christ fervently, and it may involve suffering, and this is where our life must be repurposed. Are we willing, as believers this morning, to suffer for Christ? If we ever are to be called to suffer for Christ, would we actually be willing to suffer for Him? Where the rubber meets the road. At that time, Sharon and I could have just said, you know what, this church is not worth it. We're out of here. We could have easily have done that. But God had a greater call and a greater purpose. And that's why we're here this morning. Together as the church, as the body of Christ, to build up one another and to strengthen one another. And if ever we call to suffer, are we willing to? You see, it's only as we live our lives repurposed for Jesus will we have the ability to endure suffering for Him and His church. Are we willing to repurpose? Are we, 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 we willing to, to come and re, refocus, reshape our lives under the auspices, under the authority of Jesus Christ to say, you are my child and would you serve me wholeheartedly? And like Paul, we too can rejoice in our suffering for Jesus when it does occur. Because I guarantee you, it will occur. If you haven't already experienced it, get ready for it. Because it will come down the pike. 